Hi, I'm Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well. Thank you for checking out this Parents and Caregiver series brought to you by Blue Shield of California's Blue Sky Initiative. I'm wondering, you know, I, we don't often get, you're a former psychiatric nurse, so I'm thinking you can maybe here kind of take us behind the front lines and help us see, uh, the, the question I guess is, what is inpatient mental health treatment like? What what does it look like? What kind of activities are you doing? What, what does it look like? Right, so um, inpatient focuses on, as I mentioned, balancing the individual out, right? So. Um, there's a participation of us, a, a psychiatrist to make sure that if you're taking medications, what you need to take and adjusting that to a level that's therapeutic, um, balancing out those imbalances in your brain that's causing the symptoms. There's a physical doctor involved to make sure if you come in and you also have some other health issues going on, whether it be high blood pressure, diabetes, appetite issues, whatever the case may be, we also make sure we address those things as well. So your chemical imbalance in the brain, your physical things that you may need, you get meals, a place to sleep. Oftentimes there, there are shared rooms with other persons that are there um, inpatient. There's uh, activities, group activities. There are um, therapy groups, individual therapy, um, medical treatment. So it's designed to meet all of your needs and also have enrichment um, to help get you to a better place with the goal of being able to independently sustain outside of that inpatient um, arena. So all kinds of stuff. I've, um, I mean, we had dances and we would have play therapy with animals coming in and um, people coming in to play the guitar and, and, or do art projects. So some of those things, I played a little game of one-on-one -on -one. Um, with one of the residents at an inpatient uh, facility before. We play a little basketball during the break time. There's an outdoor area. So all the things that you and I do, it's a normal space for people to just grow and get to a better place mentally so that they can function independently um, at home. Or sometimes people transition from inpatient to a residential and then they transition from the residential to on their own. So depending on what the need is. And we're going to be talking, as I said, we've got a whole separate uh, video that, that explores residential treatment facilities, Cherie. So we're, we'll encourage our listeners and viewers to go to brotherbewell.com and check that one out if you'd be interested. I have to say, Cherie, what you just talked us through, I'm sure is alleviating some of the fear and apprehension that some of our viewers and listeners have maybe had coming into this video because the environment you just described as I thought about loved ones that may or may need that that level of service it kind of puts me at ease listening you said it's just like our regular lives they do the things they play a little basketball their games or there's um, all kinds of activities that that help I think normalize it while the the therapy the therapeutic stuff is going on so I really appreciate you walking us through that I will say, Michael, as well, that um, another really important part is staying involved in your loved one's life. If it is a loved one that's in an inpatient facility, making sure that you're taking advantage of those visits. Um, though the environment is set up to try to provide all the things that a person may need, nothing replaces the love and connection you have with friends and family. So I strongly suggest um, keeping that commitment to your loved one and, and visiting and actively participating in their care so that they know what's, um, that you're there for them. And that helps with healing as well. Really important point. I'm glad you, you shared it and thought of it because I hadn't going into this conversation. Thanks a lot, Cherie, for that. I'm wondering if there is a downside to inpatient mental health care treatment, and if, if so, what those downsides might be. 
Well, Michael, people don't want to be there. Like, you know, one wants to be forced to be where they want to be. Um, also, while you're experiencing your symptoms from your mental illness, so are those other uh, patients or residents, as we would uh, call them residents, that would uh, experience those symptoms as well. So you may be having a bad day and your roommate may be having a bad day, or you witness other people's symptomology where they may be talking to themselves or um, unfortunately, violently acting out against um, other, could be staff, could be other um, residents or patients that are in the inpatient facility. So it is an environment where everyone's kind of emotionally raw and working through their issues. So for some people, that's scary, especially if you've never been in an environment uh, of that sort. So um, that does come into play, as I mentioned, every facility, all the healthcare providers are trained to work in the environment and help make it safe and therapeutic for everyone. But there are unknown variables. So it is quite the experience, but the goal is, as I mentioned, to help get you it, get you the tools so that you can move along. It is the best we can do to make some sort of normalcy in an abnormal situation. In a normal day, you wouldn't be forced to live with strangers and have several people kind of telling you what to do all day. So that, that is still there. And if you or I were to think of that today of sound mind in this moment, we, we probably wouldn't want that even if it was being done for our good. So um, it is a stressful time on your loved one and it's important to be there for them because they are dealing with that um, component of it, especially the involuntary um, admittance to those inpatient programs, right? Um, when you have that choice removed, that's difficult to deal with. Yeah, I and again, hadn't thought of that in that way, Cherie. So really appreciate that. We've touched on outpatient mental health care a little and on residential treatment. And as I said before, we've got whole videos on those topics on brotherbewell.com. But for the sake of this conversation, can you briefly summarize what happens immediately after a patient leaves an inpatient facility? Right. So after you leave an inpatient facility, depending on your symptoms at the time and your plan of care, your plan of care is worked on from the moment you're admitted to the moment you're discharged. They're always looking at what's the next step. Um, it could be um, you, you were there for a specific amount of time, you finished a program and you were discharged home to your family. Um, you may be discharged um, to a, a residential facility, something that's still involuntary and you have to stay there, but maybe you stay at a, resi a residential home for a certain amount of time and if you're successful there, then you're released to be on your own. So depending on the situation and your needs, um, the discharge is still, everyone's still very mindful. What tends to happen after inpatient stays that are involuntary is usually the court or a person has conservatorship, um, essentially like your guardian over your person and your medical decisions and possibly your financial decisions. So to get from under that type of conservatorship or uh, guardianship, the individual has to prove that they can do all those regular activities of daily living and do those things on their own. So depending on the situation, that has to be proven. So it may be as easy as being discharged home um, or proving that you can successfully sustain and stay on a program um, and then that's changed. So. Uh, there is a legal component to involuntary inpatient mental health care um, that really dictates kind of your discharge disposition, where you will go and what that looks like. Really, really appreciate sharing that information, and Sheree. And before I let you go, I got to tell you, you and I met as colleagues. I, I could imagine your patients are really, really lucky. Your level of knowledge and the care in which you even communicate some of these issues would put me at ease. And I know that you put a lot of people at ease every day. So thanks for what you do. Oh, thank you, Michael. I'm very honored and, bl and blessed to help others. Um, it's what I get up to do every day. So 
I'm honored to be of service to people. We are honored to have you with us, Sheree Kreiner, registered nurse, former psychiatric nurse, and vice president of the Capital City Black Nurses Association. Thank you, ma'am, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. I'd like to give you a quick phone number. We touched a little bit, Sheree and I, on suicide a few minutes ago. If you or a loved one is thinking about anything related to suicide, there's a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline that I'd like you to have. It's 1-800-273-8255. Call 1-800-273-8255. You can call that number any time of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Call it. Don't hesitate. There's help there for you if you're thinking about it. Uh, suicide. I'd also like to thank our sponsor for this and all of our uh, conversations in our Parents and Caregiver series, Blue Shield of California, and specifically their Blue Sky Initiative. That initiative boosts access to mental health support. You can learn all about their fantastic program at bluesky.blueshieldca.com. That's bluesky.blueshieldca.com. Another quick website, brotherbewell.com. I mentioned it before. That's ours. Videos just like this one, audio podcasts, print pieces, incredible stories of strength and resilience, all designed to help boys and men of color, 13 and up, uh, be well, frankly. That's where the name of our organization, organization comes from, Brother Be Well. Check that all out at brotherbewell.com. My name, Michael P. Coleman. I'm content director for Brother Be Well, and it's a great honor of mine to, to do that for you. I'd like to ask you to do two quick things for me. Take great care of yourself and take great care of somebody else. Until next time, bye-bye.